pelvic inflammatory disease is the first topic that we are going to discuss in infection category pelvic inflammatory disease is basically a term that is used to describe infection and inflammation of the female pelvic organs such as uterus full of in tubes and ovaries pelvic inflammatory disease is caused by sexually transmitted infections uh, the most common sexually transmitted infection in the uk is chlamydia trachomatis and the other less common cause is neisseria gonorrhea so chlamydia trachomatis that is the most common sexually transmitted infection and neisseria gonorrhea they can cause cervicitis infection or inflammation of the cervix which can send upward to the uterus fallopian tubes and ovaries and can cause or result in pelvic inflammatory disease so chlamydia trachomatis and azalea gonorrhea they can cause cervicitis which can ascend upward and can lead to pelvic inflammatory disease so as it's an infection of the pelvic organs so the patient will present to you with lower abdomen pain and fever because it's an infection there will be deep dyspareunia dysuria and menstrual irregularities vaginal or cervical discharge and cervical excitation lower abdomen pain and fever and cervical excitation remember these three important features of pelvic inflammatory disease cervical excitation is only present in the pelvic inflammatory disease no other disease has this feature that is cervical excitation that is also known as cervical motion tenderness what is cervical motion tenderness cervical motion tenderness means severe pain on by manual examination or two finger examination of the cervix excruciating or severe pain on two finger or by manual examination of the cervix is called cervical excitation or cervical motion tenderness so the important features are lower abdomen pain and fever so whenever fever is present it points it will point towards infection so fever with other features such as lower abdomen pain dyspareunia post coital bleeding or intermenstrual bleeding and vaginal discharge you will suspect pelvic inflammatory disease and to confirm your diagnosis you will do an endo cervical swab and send it to the lab to see if the causative organism is chlamydia or gonorrhea what are the risk factors that will be mentioned in the history of a patient with pelvic inflammatory disease uh, these risk factors are important to remember young females less than 25 years of age who has ius or iud in place or with a new or a multiple sexual partners previous history of sexually transmitted infections or uterine instrumentation such as surgical termination of a pregnancy so remember these risk factors if you want to make a diagnosis of pelvic inflammatory disease because some other diseases can also present with these features such as cervicitis adenomyosis endometriosis they can also present with these features so it's important to remember these risk factors because the features such as post coital bleeding or intermenstrual bleeding uh they can be a features of other diseases such as cervicitis or cervical ectropion etc
so you can say that post quadrilateral bleeding one cause of post quadrilateral bleeding is pelvic inflammatory disease or cervicitis because both of them are the infection caused by glamidia and gonorrhea then how you are going to differentiate between cervicitis and pelvic inflammatory disease because cervicitis involves only cervix and it does not send upward in the abdomen so all these features without lower abdominal pain will make a diagnosis of cervicitis deep dyspareunia dysuria menstrual irregularities vaginal or cervical discharge all these features will be present in cervicitis as well only two features will not be present that is cervical excitation and lower abdomen or pelvic pain because cervicitis only involves cervix so lower abdomen pain will be absent in cervicitis the risk factors for both cervicitis and pelvic inflammatory disease is same and the features are also almost same so the important risk factor for pelvic inflammatory disease include history of ius or iud and new or multiple sexual partners and the third one is any surgical termination of pregnancy so if someone with a history of any of these three present to you with post coital bleeding or intermenstrual bleeding or vaginal discharge then you will suspect pelvic inflammatory disease and you will take an endo cervical swab and send it to the lab to confirm your diagnosis now the treatment of pelvic inflammatory disease it is important to treat the pelvic inflammatory disease because of its complication the complication of pelvic inflammatory disease include they can cause infertility chronic pelvic pain ectopic pregnancy and tubo ovarian abscess the, these are very a dangerous complication of pelvic inflammatory disease so it is important to know the treatment of pelvic inflammatory disease what is the treatment in outpatient and what is the patient treatment in inpatient so the treatment for outpatient include intramuscular septazone plus oral doxycycline plus oral metronidazole intramuscular septazone single dose of intramuscular septazone 1 g oral doxycycline 100 mg for 14 days 100 mg bd for 14 days and oral metronidazole 400 mg bd for 14 days so these three drugs doxycycline or metronidazole they are given orally and ceftriaxone is given intramuscularly now for the inpatient treatment all of these three drugs will be used as an iv injections so iv ceftriaxone iv or iv doxycycline and iv metronidazole is the treatment of pelvic inflammatory disease for in patients another regime and latest one for outpatient management of pelvic inflammatory disease include oral ufloxacin plus oral metronidazole this regime can also be tried so one regime is same for outpatient and inpatient that is ceftriaxone doxycycline and metronidazole for outpatient they will be given orally and iv and for inpatient they will be given iv and one latest regime is oral ufloxacin plus oral metronidazole so pelvic inflammatory disease in history history of iud or ius or multiple or new sexual partner and surgical termination of pregnancy will be mentioned feature of lower abdomen pain fever intermenstrual bleeding post coital bleeding and vaginal discharge the diagnosis is made by taking an endo cervical swab and sending it to the lab and the treatment is ceftriaxone doxycycline and metronidazole 
now some complication of pelvic inflammatory disease it can cause infertility it can cause chronic pelvic pain and it is also a risk factor for ectopic pregnancy so someone with a history of pelvic inflammatory disease can also develop ectopic pregnancy and an important complication of untreated pelvic inflammatory disease is tubo ovarian abscess if left untreated or if the treatment is ineffective pelvic inflammatory disease can lead to abscess formation in the fallopian tubes so whenever there is abscess formation in the body what will happen high grade fever in pelvic inflammatory disease the fever is usually low grade in tubo ovarian abscess the fever is will be high grade plus there will be lower abdominal pain and tenderness as well tenderness is not usually a feature of pelvic inflammatory disease so high grade fever and lower abdominal pain and tenderness plus no discharge you will suspect tubo ovarian abscess in pelvic inflammatory disease there is usually a history of vaginal discharge so lower abdominal pain high grade fever and no discharge these are some important diagnostic point for to make a diagnosis of tubo ovarian abscess what are the other diagnostic points that will be mentioned in the scenario that is a mass in the pelvic area or a mass on ultrasound because abscess will lead to the formation of a mass like structure in the fallopian tubes so this point can also be mentioned in the scenario the risk factors and the history will be the same as for pelvic inflammatory disease such as a new partner or multiple sexual partner or a history of iud or ius or a history of surgical termination of pregnancy so the history will be same and the clinical features will be different such as lower abdomen pain and tenderness high grade fever and no discharge plus a mass in the pelvic area on ultrasound or on examination plus there will be history of untreated pelvic inflammatory disease how you will manage remember that if you are suspecting pelvic inflammatory disease then the investigation that you order is endocervical swab while in case of tubo ovarian abscess if there is abscess formation then you will not select endocervical swab because endocervical swab will take days to return and if you are suspecting an abscess then a surgical intervention is required urgently so the investigation that you will select in the management of tubo ovarian abscess or to confirm the diagnosis of tubo ovarian abscess is pelvic ultrasound so if you are suspecting tubo ovarian abscess then you will select the investigation as pelvic ultrasound and endocervical swab if you are suspecting pelvic inflammatory disease after confirming the tubo ovarian abscess on ultrasound laparoscopy is usually done to drain the abscess so drainage and antibiotic is the treatment of tubo ovarian abscess the antibiotics will be the same because the patient need to be admitted to the hospital with tubo ovarian abscess so we will give the inpatient medication such as iv ceftriaxone iv doxycycline and iv metronidazole so this was all about pelvic inflammatory disease and its management and its diagnosis
an important complication of pelvic inflammatory disease that was before we didn't discuss. So remember that intrauterine contraceptives are a major risk factor for PID, but other conditions such as which can present with lower abdomen pain, they include adenomyosis and adrometiosis. So the presence of uh, IUS or IU, IUS or Marina will relieve the symptoms of endometriosis or adenomyosis and fibroids. But on the other hand, IUS is a risk factor for pelvic inflammatory disease. So someone with a history of IUS and present with lower abdomen pain, it is most likely PAD and not endometriosis or adenomyosis because their symptoms are relieved by the presence of IUS. What is endometriosis and adenomyosis? And that uh, we'll discuss in the coming slides. Another cause of lower abdomen pain is Escherman syndrome. What is Escherman syndrome? Escherman syndrome is a lower abdomen pain due to endometrial adhesions. Endometrial adhesion that usually are formed after dilatation and curettage or surgical termination of pregnancy. Basically, it is a complication of dilatation and curettage. After dilatation and curettage, uh, adhesions are formed in the endometrial tissues, which is called Asherman syndrome, which can lead to lower abdominal pain. So pelvic inflammatory disease, endometriosis or adenomyosis and Asherman syndrome, they all can present with lower abdominal pain. The only difference is them between us and the history of the patient. If a patient develop lower abdomen pain after a dilatation and curettage, then the diagnosis is most likely Asherman syndrome. So patient with post coital bleeding, intermenstrual bleeding, and vaginal discharge, but no abdominal pain, and a red or inflamed uvulva and cervix, then your diagnosis will be cervicitis. What is the treatment of cervicitis? So the presentation of cervicitis will be same as pelvic inflammatory disease, only lower abdomen pain will not be present. And on examination, the cervix will be red and inflamed. The treatment of cervicitis, if the cause is chlamydia, then we will give doxycycline 100 milligram for seven days. The risk factor for cervicitis and pelvic inflammatory disease, both are same. So the first line, treatment for chlamydia is doxycycline 100 milligram DD for seven days or azithromycin can also be used. One gram azithromycin on the first day and then 500 milligram azithromycin on second and third day this is the second line treatment for chlamydia. And if you are suspecting nazaria gonorrhea, then a single dose of ceftriaxone, one gram, or a single dose of ciprofloxacin, 500 milligram. So for gonorrhea, only a single dose of ceftriaxone or a ciprofloxacin is required, while for chlamydia, doxycycline for seven days or azithromycin for three days is required. So we have discussed two causes of post coital bleeding or intermenstrual bleeding and vaginal discharge. That was cervicitis and pelvic inflammatory disease. Now another cause of 
Is it clear everyone up to this point? Yes, sir. So another cause of post coital bleeding or intermenstrual bleeding or even vaginal discharge. Remember that the most common cause of post coital bleeding in young females is cervical ectropion. followed by pelvic inflammatory disease or cervicitis. So post-coital bleeding can be caused by, in young females, post-coital bleeding, the first thing that you will think of is cervical ectropion. The second one is pelvic inflammatory disease or cervicitis. What is cervical ectropion? Normally, the active cervix or the outside of the cervix the part of the cervix that lie outside the uterus, uh, it contains stratified squamous epithelium. But if this epithelium is replaced by the columnar epithelium, columnar epithelium is fragile and it bleeds easily. So if the stratified squamous epithelium of the active cervix is Ectocervix is replaced by the columnar epithelium in high estrogen states. What are the examples of high estrogen states? High estrogen states example include pregnancy and COCP, combined oral contraceptive pills. So a female with a history of, a young female with a history of COCP, or during pregnancy, if she develop vaginal bleeding, either intermenstrual vaginal bleeding or post vaginal bleeding, or just vaginal bleeding, then you will suspect cervical ectropion. So someone with a history of COCP, with a use of history of COCP, or someone during pregnancy, develop vaginal bleeding, you will think of cervical ectropion because cervical ectropion is the most common cause of postcoital bleeding. Almost 33% of the cases of postcoital bleeding are caused by cervical ectropion. And the cause of cervical ectropion is high estrogen states such as pregnancy and COCP. High estrogen causes a migration of the columnar epithelium from endocervix to the ectocervix. That's why lead to the formation of cervical ectropion. On examination, usually there is a red ring around the cervical os. So in short, someone with a history of COCP use, present with post bleeding, vaginal discharge or intermenstrual bleeding, any type of vaginal bleeding. And on examination, there is a red ring around the os, you will say it's cervical ectropion. So for PID, history of IUS or IUD, history of new or multiple sexual partners, history of surgical termination of pregnancy, while for cervical ectropion, history of COCP use or during pregnancy. So it's important to remember the risk factors because that's how you can make a correct diagnosis because both of them can present with similar features such as post bleeding, intermenstrual bleeding, or vaginal discharge. For the treatment of pel pelvic inflammatory disease, antibiotics are required while for the treatment of cervical ectropion, uh, usually no treatment is required unless uh, the patient is symptomatic. If the patient is symptomatic, the first thing that you need to do before starting the treatment is to do a cervical smear to rule out the cervical cancer or abnormal cytology. If the cervical smear is normal, then you can treat the symptomatic cervical ectropion. So the management of cervical ectropion is Usually no treatment is required if the patient is asymptomatic, but if the patient is symptomatic and you, you want to treat cervical ectropion, then 
before starting the treatment, you need to do a cervical smear. If it's normal, then we can do chirotherapy, diathermy, or cautery with silver nitrate. So all these procedures can destroy the abnormal epithelium and the patient symptoms will be relieved. So this was all about cervical ectropion. Presentation is intermensal bleeding, post pedal bleeding, excessive vaginal discharge. These features can also be present in pelvic inflammatory disease and cervicitis. That's why it's important to remember the risk factors for cervical ectropion and for pelvic inflammatory disease and So if the ectropion is symptomatic, for example, it causes post quadral bleeding, then we need to refer the patient for colposcopy. Otherwise, reassure the patient. So in short, a bleeding cervical ectropion with a normal smear before starting treatment for a symptomatic cervical ectropion, the investigation that we need to do is cervical smear. And if the cervical smear is normal, then we can refer the patient for colposcopy. So remember this indication of colposcopy in case of cervical ectropion. A symptomatic cervical ectropion with normal cervical smear refer for colposcopy. This can be asked in the exam. So it's important to remember this indication of colposcopy because in the coming slides, we are going to discuss other indication for colposcopy. And this is an important indication for colposcopy. A patient with cervical ectropion plus normal smear refer for colposcopy. If asymptomatic cervical ectropion, then there is no need to do anything, just reassure the patient. What will colposcopy show? Colposcopy will show a red ring around the cervical loss. So let's do an example. A 31 year old presents inquiring about vaginal spotting two days ago. So a patient is presented to you with vaginal bleed. Two days history of vaginal bleed. She is 31 year old. She is on COCP. So she is taking COCP and she is complaining of vaginal spotting. Last cervical smear was one year ago and reported normal. On examination, cervical extropion is diagnosed. There is no bleeding on touch. So a patient with vaginal spotting and a history of COCP use, the diagnosis is most likely a cervical ectropion. Her smear was done one year ago. That is normal. Normally, cervical smear is then every three years in patients who are aged 25 to 49. So cervical smear is done every three year in patient with 25 to 49 years old. In this scenario, it was done one year ago, so there is no need to repeat the cervical smear and it was normal. And as the cervical ectropion is not causing any symptoms or there's no bleeding on touch. So the next step is to reassure the patient. But if the cervical ectropion bleeds on touch and the cervical smear is normal, then we will refer the patient for colposcopy. And if smear was done three years ago, then the next step would be to order the cervical smear again. Another example, who will read this example? 
Dr. Asya, can you please read the example two? It was in five years old when it presents complaining of post quite a famous young lady. Alta can be chose to sentiment even high. Hitting movements and heart is seen on Alta Sam. Her abdomen is soft, relaxed, and non tender. So I think top down in the movie dance. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you. Uh, we can't hear her properly. A 29 year old female presents complaining of post coital painless vaginal bleeding. Ultrasound shows placenta anterior and high. So, a pregnant female is presented to us with post coital painless vaginal bleeding. So, we know that uh, the risk factors for cervical ectopion are high estrogen state, such as COCP and pregnancy. And in this case, the patient is pregnant. So in pregnancy, uh, the causes of painless vaginal bleeding, there are two causes of painless vaginal bleeding. One is cervical ectropion and other is placenta previa. Placenta previa is a low-lying placenta. So the patient is presented to us with post coital bleeding, painless vaginal bleeding. So it can be placenta previa and it can be cervical ectropion. We cannot say. Now the next line will help us differentiate between these two. And that is the ultrasound shows placenta anterior and high. So if the placenta is anterior and high, it means it's not the placenta previa because placenta previa is low lying placenta that is covering the cervical os. And fetal movements and heart rate are seen on the ultrasound. In case of placenta previa, uh, there may be fetal signs of fetal distress. Her abdomen is soft, lax, and non-tender. Placental abruption can also cause vaginal bleeding in during pregnancy. But so, this is yes, this is painless, and uh, the abdomen is soft, lax, and non-tender. In placental abruption, the abdomen is uh, hard and like a board and it is tender. So ultrasound shows placenta anterior and high. It ruled out placenta previa. And there is no fetal distress and the abdomen is soft. It ruled out placental abruption. We are only left with the cervical ectropion because cervical ectropion can also occur in high estrogen states such as pregnancy. So the likely diagnosis is cervical ectropion. So the cervical ectropion does not bleed on touch. We only reassure the patient. If it's bleed on touch, then before starting treatment, we'll do a cervical smear. If it's normal, then we'll refer the patient for colposcopy. And colposcopy will show a red ring around the os. So, uh, these were some causes of post coital or intermenstrual bleeding in young females, which was pelvic inflammatory disease, cervicitis, and cervical ectropion. These are three important causes of post coital intermenstrual bleeding or vaginal discharge in young sexually active females, PAD and cervicitis in young sexually active. Females, females with new sexual partner or multiple sexual partners, while young females who are not sexually active or who are taking COCPs, then the cause will be cervical atrophion. Now, post coital bleed in menopausal women or in older women, what can cause post coital bleed in? Post coital bleed, dyspareunia intermenstrual bleed in older women is caused by the most common cause is atrophic vaginitis and endometrial carcinoma can also cause post coital bleed in uh, older females so we'll discuss uh, the causes of post coital bleeding in older females or in menopausal women in next lecture
we'll end our today's lecture here. Next lecture, we'll discuss post the causes of postcardial bleeding in menopausal women, uh, cervical and breast screening. Indication for colposcopy. Endometrial cancer, atrophic vaginitis, ovarian cancer, meek syndrome, fibroids. And we'll finish gynecology in next lecture and then we'll start obstetrics. Until then, it's a goodbye from my side. Take care, laughs, and good night. Laughs.